and you still got hair problems and you don't know which way to turn. You don't know what you deserve. Hello, everyone. Hi, hi, hi. Welcome to Let's Talk Hair. I mean, we had a phenomenal last last week show, but I got you again with another good show. And I am telling you, this person here, you have never, never heard the words that are going to come out of her mouth. We've never had this type. Well, we've had so many phenomenal people. But this is someone we want to honor, the, a person who's been uh, traveling and is now international, okay? So, uh, Dr. Afia, let's talk about her. Who is she? Why don't you know her? So, you need to get to know her. You need to, um, and I say this with the most humbleness ever, you need to Google her, okay? So, you need to Google her. She is not playing with you about hair therapy, Okay. And hair therapy, she's been on Good Morning America, okay? And Robin Roberts interviewed her, and she got all of her truth out about the crown. And so her passion goes. Now, I'm going to tell you one thing. When I was reading about her and understanding that how she started in humble times, how do you go from humble times to the big times and still stay humble and have integrity? OK, so my special guest right here, uh, as I understand it, she grew up uh, as a family hairstylist. Is that true? Yes. 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 And graduating from lawn chairs. OK, at cookouts and family events and everything like that. You know, when people say to you, girl, can you do my hair and they don't pay you? and they're a family member, girl, I'm your auntie. I, I used to wipe your butt. And then they don't give you anything, but she didn't care. She had a purpose and a plan. And also holding a space in her college dorm for her roommates and a mini salon. The conversation during the hair process were her favorite top topics, her traits and her skillful uh, skillfulness as a active listener. She listened to you. She gave you advice and she spoke her truth and her truth led her in so many different elements. And I'm going to tell you in the field of psychology, earning her degree from the university of Pennsylvania and Howard university ever heard of Howard. Okay. Yes. And at the age of 26, Dr. Afir earned a PhD in clinical psychology and was and was a full-time Columbia uh, University student. Dr. Afia has invested her time, her patience, her practice, her truth. And now I welcome you to the show and you know how we do. Let's clap and give her a warm applause and welcome Dr. Afia. Thank you and welcome you to Let's Talk Hair. <laughs> Well, thank you. I feel my heart's all racing. I feel all warm inside. That was the best introduction I ever had. Thank you for that. I'm glad to be here. Yes, yes, yes. Tell us. Um, I hear about the lawn chairs and the, you know, just tell us um, about the beginning because we see the end or we see the middle, and we want to know. How did you start? You were baby in the womb and God already had Jeremiah 29, 11. He had a purpose and a plan for you. And how did you start with just the love of hair? Mm -hmm. Wonderful question. I, I grew up having a lot of hair. So I think um, a lot of time was dedicated to my mom um, doing my hair. 
every Sunday night was uh, wash day and so she would um, let me pick the number of braids that she would give me every week. It was a special time because I'm the youngest of four. And so that opportunity to be one-on-one -on -one with my mom was through the hair care process. That was like the only time my brothers or my sister wasn't involved was mom to daughter time. Um, and so every Sunday night sat between her legs and she would do my hair and we would talk. Um, and so I think that, that it became a healing therapeutic time in my life. And so I wanted to translate that to other spaces. Um, so I, I would always, like you said in the bio, love doing my relatives hair. Um, and just, I found it healing and artistic, like almost like drawing or painting. My, my medium is hair. And so um, that, that translated really smoothly to college because I was at a predominantly white institution for college and people needed their hair done. And so a lot of the black students will come to my dorm room um, and I do their hair and I talk and connect. And so one day I remember talking to my aunt Brenda on the phone, she's now an ancestor. And I was telling her, should I go on to study psychology or go on to study hair after I graduate from college? And she said, well, why can't you do both? Now, I don't think she was telling me to do both at the same exact time, but that's the way I interpreted it and thought, hmm, I can do hair and therapy together. And so in my college dorm room, basically I birthed psychotherapy, which is using hair as an entry point into mental health. And so it wasn't until after I got a PhD that I went to hair school. And so just to even really commit to that process of authentically engaging my community through mental health, I knew it had to include hair. So that that's my, my journey so far. Wow, I'm, I'm excited because um, as hairstylists, um, like I've been uh, doing it for 36 years and Ooh. I know that we're like little therapists. Yeah. Um, some of us, some of us are little gossipers, but we should be <laughs> therapists and that could lead us into our purpose. But you kind of took it to another level that is not quite, it's like, it's like the Harvard or the Howard <laughs> of, um, we would say, um, it's, it's a level that most of us may not ever get but we can stand on your shoulders to your truth and just honor you. And, and you're at a point now where you can write your own ticket. Like you've earned that writing that degree. I, I do remember on your social media page where I actually saw you um, on with Robin Roberts um, on Good Morning America. And I also saw you in a courtroom scene. And so when you started attracting attention, how did you begin to attract the attention of the media and the press? Great question. I'm not quite sure how that happened, but I know I know that with my Instagram account, um, that that's a, the way a lot of people reach out to me. Um, I just document my life in terms of what it looks like to be a, a psychologist and what it looks like to be a hairstylist and taking decent pictures and telling stories. So I think what 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 made um, attention come to me is that I do a lot of writing as well. So I, I've published over 20 um, peer reviewed journal articles in scientific journals about um, hair and psychology. So I became somewhat of a subject matter expert so that if you Google, right, and put in hair and mental health, you're gonna see my name. Um, and I think that that just came from doing what I love. I like, I like psychology and I like hair. And so um, that's what I talk about. And so that's what um, people can see my passion for it. So I think that that's probably a part of it. <laughs> so tell me like with psychology and mental health, how do we combine the two, uh, which we know how we combine the two, but for our, um, our listeners and the people that are watching and, and please, you all are able to ask her any questions because we do have our repeat people who will ask you questions. <laughs> but, um, but yes, um, how do we combine the two, uh, psycho hair therapy, um, to being behind the chair? Are you currently behind the chair? So I haven't been behind the chair since COVID. 
but I've been doing a lot of virtual work uh, <laughs> and helping people do their own hair um, virtually. But um, so hair definitely is an entry point into mental health services. People are oftentimes more likely to get their hair done to, than to see a therapist. And so think about the conversations that are naturally happening during the hair care process, right? Um, in terms of, it's one of the rare opportunities that someone is really trying to listen and understand what we're saying, even bathes us. I always think that that's so striking that we actually get like bathed as an adult, you know, and um, while getting our hair washed and how much can be released from that process. So even studying each stage of the hair care process, the conversation um, can really provide a relief or release. And so, um, too, our mental health is so connected to our um, hair and identity in terms of our hair is a complex language system. We can tell a lot about each other based on how we wear our hair. We can tell someone's age, their uh, maybe education, marital status, what part of the country they're from, all, all these different things um, from the hair that sometimes we don't put into words. And so it just is a really interesting opportunity to understand healing, but also stress, right? Um, in terms of hair stress, when, when we sometimes can make our hair do things that it doesn't want to do and how our hair will speak back to us um, if you're too rough with it. Um, and it's interesting too, because the th same things that help us to manage our stress levels are the same things that we need to do to take care of our hair, like drinking water. Um, it can include exercise, getting enough sleep, eating nutrient rich foods. All of that is a factor in stress management, but also in healthy hair care and hair growth. So I just see it naturally connecting and occurring together. Okay. Now this is, this is, uh, oh, Betty Thomas Williams who uh, supports uh, Deserve Big Time. Um, First Lady uh, wants to say hello to you all, uh, to you as well. Um, I I love this combination because um, when I am doing treatments and stuff like that, there is already someone who is um, mentally already damaged. Mm -hmm. And you have the insecurity and you have the depression that can come in with hair loss. Yeah. So not just any hairstylist can handle someone because every word, every sentence can be either an element of altitude or it can damage them even worse. So they're looking for what I would call hope. So how do you element the hope that they're looking for because they're looking right into your eyes mm -hmm. and they're saying to you, I have no hope, but you have something that I need. I wish I had your energy. I wish I had your faith, but will I ever get my, my hair, my body, everything uh, back? Dr. Athea, how do you get them there? How do you get them there uh, with that hope? Mm, that's a beautiful question. Yeah, I, I'm just thinking about how our lives in general reflect life, death, and rebirth processes, and even life, death, and rebirth happening in the hair care process and with hair growth and with hair loss. Um, I think it's really important that we understand these cycles of hair mm -hmm. um, and how much hair reflects what's going on in the mind, body, and spirit. Um, I think that it's really important that um, we recognize that people can go through a grieving process um, and the stages of grief and loss when it comes to hair in terms of that that initial maybe denial that people might might experience or shock um, going through stages of, of anger or going through periods of depression, um, bargaining or even some hopelessness, but then ultimately getting to acceptance. And so I think that that just again, like We've all lost important people in our life. And I think, again, hair loss can reflect the head process too, feeling like you've lost part of yourself. And so I think that it's important to have that, that spiritual grounding um, and understanding that, that um, 
things can get better or the way that we see things can get better. Um, I think that, like I was saying earlier, how well we take care of ourselves can reflect in our hair. So investing more time and energy and positive affirmations into the hair process and getting connected to people who can support and help. I definitely think that stylists do have a responsibility of connecting with um, not only mental health professionals, but also um, dermatologists, right? Tricologists, people who study the hair and the scalp. And so recognizing that for all of our clients that are experiencing alopecia areata, um, experiencing a variety of hair loss experiences or scalp disease that we really need to be in partnership so that not only can we provide words of support, but also refer to resources respectfully in terms of recognizing where you know, our limitations are, but also then connecting to healthcare providers that can provide more um, medicines and support and procedures that can restore the hair. I love it. Um, okay. I want to talk about the Scientology and the science of natural black hair. Um, also, I want I, I want you to uh, explain to us after we talk about that, have we put a Band-Aid on keeping our hair healthy? We might want to talk about that first if you want to, but but I do want to, the Scientology of it, but I do want to talk about, have we put a Band-Aid on? I know, um, I want you to explain that because I know social media has also been some type of impressions, Im impression of a consciousness of just someone wants to be a Beyonce. Beyonce is not even Sasha Fierce every day, but they want to look like and uh, a certain way, and we're compromising our crown. So how would we? I I I I put that all out there, but uh, are we putting a band aid on our 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 own crowns? Mm. You you're trying to get to the root right here, right? I, I'm trying to get in while I got you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's interesting. I've I've always heard the saying, "He who controls images controls minds." Right? In terms of what we are being presented with and what hair health is, um, sometimes we think hair health is wearing a particular hairstyle, but it's not. Right? It's thinking about how clean your scalp is, um, what products you're using that the body can process. Um, right, because I do have a philosophy. Can I? I'll say my philosophy before I go further. That I'm, I'm still trying to commit to it. But uh, <laughs> anything you put on your hair and on your skin, you should be able to eat. That's I'm trying to work with that. So anything you put on your hair or on your skin, you should be able to eat. Now you see I have lipstick on and I got some edge control. So I'm still working on that concept. But basically recognizing that what we put on ourselves topically can go almost faster into our bloodstream than when we're when we ingest something. And so recognizing having plant-based products or having a lot of water in our you know hair products are actually really important, right? Because the only thing that can moisturize hair is water, right? Everything else seals water in because we all know that oil and water don't mix. And so just recognizing what we are using to seal the water into the hair cuticle. But um, it just really makes me think about <laughs> not doing too much to the hair, right? Not putting too much heat, not pulling it too hard. All of these extremes can um, cause hair loss and damage and breakage. And um, I'm just thinking yeah, heat damage, all of these different things. And so I think that it's important for us to recognize what our hair wants to do and not fight it. Um, I'm mindful that there are so many different types of hair textures, porosities, all these different things. So not everyone's hair is going to function in the same way. And so I'm just thinking about how do we pay attention to our hair so that it's getting everything that it needs. So my hair might need something different from people who are watching, right? And so the health of my hair can look varied. But a, a major piece to me for all hair to me is still the water. The water piece, right? Mm -hmm. That I think some of us are chronically dehydrated, mm -hmm. <laughs> which impacts um, the health of our hair. But also, I think sometimes we can be afraid to put water in our hair. 
Um, I think that that comes from, you know, how we're, we're socialized if it's raining or if it's, you know, not wash days. And so just to be mindful of, um, yeah, just being hydrated, being so critical to hair health overall. And um, a lot of times people ask what products I use, but again, I say, what am I doing to my body that then produces um, healthy hair? So I hope I'm, I'm addressing it, but it just makes me think about how social media does present a style that like, oh, I want that style versus really thinking about well, how much tension is there, how much heat was used, what products were used, does it have um, carcinogens that could actually um, disrupt your endocrine system, right, your hormone system. I look at a lot of hair products and sometimes it has these chemicals and it actually disrupt your body being able to process like certain hormones. And so um, that that's where my attention is going from that question. Okay, you put it, uh, and and this is, and the reason why I'm loving this so so well is because sometimes I kind of feel like I'm out there on my own, and you're actually digging into the world of, and I don't feel like I'm on my own, but we just got to come together, yeah, uh, because we're all standing uh, in our own corners, and so. Um, you have my respect, but you're act actually uh, getting down to the root of it. There is, a, and do you believe this? I think you, you've already answered it. Um, there is no direct recipe just for everyone. Everyone has a combination of different textures, different lifestyle, different diets. So I have to handle you different. So where you go like, well, my friend got this or she got that. You all are not, even Siamese twins <laughs> has a little bit of a different DNA. And so I have to handle, I handle things different. I chose my product line to be on the plant-based level, mm -hmm. minimizing um, all of the chemicals and things like that. Um, going in the hair shaft when I need it closing it when I need it. And, you know, so I like uh, to get down uh, to, I like to bypass with hair tools to get to from the epidermis to the dermis where my vitamins are. Mm -hmm. And so, but everyone's different. So I have to handle you different. So um, you, um, you play a vital role, but you, you led yourself in a courtroom. And when you got in the courtroom, you actually was speaking your truth in the courtroom. Let's talk about how did we get to the courtroom? What did we speak about in the courtroom? If there was an amendment or anything that you were trying to get to pass or what was that like? What did you do? All right. All right. It's funny because growing up, I really never learned anything about courtrooms or Congress or government, it just, you know, I think I missed some parts of social studies. So I really had to reacquaint myself with what happens in those spaces. Um, so I've been doing research on the psychology of hair since about 2011, officially, like doing presentations and doing research studies for the past 10 years. Um, and so in 2019, um, the Crown Coalition and Joy Collective and um, other lobbyists and people who, who support various government bills like Ajo Asamoa um, developed something called the Crown Act. So the Crown Act stands for creating a respectful and open world for natural hair. So again, creating a respectful and open world for natural hair. And in 2019, um, Senate, State Senator Holly Mitchell um, was the first to present um, this Crown Act to her state Senate, and it actually passed. And so what the Crown Act does, um, it prevents Black people from experiencing hair discrimination for natural hairstyles, such as twists, braids, locks, bantu knots, afros, so the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was supposed to prevent racial discrimination. However, there was this sort of loophole where hair wasn't a factor, but we know that hair is a manifestation and reflection of race. 
And so um, people were getting denied jobs or fired because of their hairstyle or texture. And so what the Crown Act is supposed to do is for, to protect black hairstyles in the workspace, in schools, and even in housing. And I'm sure we've all seen the news stories of children being denied access to school or graduation because they had locks or couldn't participate in a wrestling match, right? Or couldn't graduate or couldn't take pictures because they had braids in. So all of these factors leading to this um, cause to support the crown. So since I had been researching um, the psychology of black hair for a decade that the people um, were looking for evidence, the, the politicians and lobbyists were looking for evidence that hair discrimination could have a psychological consequence on the lives of black people. And so I had lots of articles on that. So I never in my life imagined that black hair would bring me to Congress. I never thought that. And so I had the opportunity to go to various um, uh, Congress people's offices and speak with their staff about this very important issue of hair discrimination. And so as a result of having those conversations, they actually invited me then into the, the hearings, the actual hearings to be able to come in and share time specific, right? I only had probably about three minutes each time I testified, three minutes to testify on the psychological consequences of hair discrimination on black people. And so I, I got to testify in New Jersey. I got to testify in Maryland, uh, Wisconsin, uh, Delaware. I'm forgetting all the, I think it's, <laughs> Not every place passed. I remember I did South Dakota. It did not work out there. Um, so there was pushback and resistance. But um, just really thinking about uh, taking what I was doing in the salon and in my research lab and being able to present it in this very public space um, and going on the record to say why there needs to be laws that protect black hair. Wow, that is, whoo, that is, uh, amazing to the point where I, I, I mean, I, I want everybody out here. How are you uh, enjoying that? So by hand claps, let me know if you're enjoying it. <laughs> They're enjoying it. They're enjoying it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay, stop clapping, you guys. I, I appreciate that. Uh, I, um, I, I'm enjoying to the point where um you let's get this right you work the act is it called creating a respect for hair for the national the natural hair you're creating a respectful and open world for natural hair respectful and open hair uh for the natural hair mm -hmm. right and that was the crown act Yes, correct. Okay. And when was that passed? So the first time it was passed was in 2019. And as of today, I believe 14 states have passed the Crown Act. So it's officially on record that if someone um, discriminates against a Black person based on wearing twists, braids, locks, bantu knots, that it's actually illegal. However, that still means then there are 36 states that it is legal to fire someone, not hire someone, um, or not let them go to a school or live a certain place based on having those hairstyles. Okay, you have a question um, from Natasha Wright. Uh, what do you think are some of these psychological consequences? Wonderful question. <laughs> so basically thinking about the emotional toll that it takes when you are being discriminated against. Because I'm sure at least at some point in our lives, maybe someone's cut in front of us in a line or maybe someone was rough with us someplace and, you know, it kind of sits with you. But when it comes to your physical body, someone not allowing you to enter a certain space or get a job because of your, the way your hair is styled, it creates anger, <laughs> sadness, shame, disgust. And the thing is, it's not. Um, just in that specific moment, it can be years and years later. So I have an article that was published in the American Journal of Orthopsychiatry called Don't Get It Twisted, um, that talks about hair discrimination within black communities. And we were finding that people who were like in their 70s could still recall the emotional intensity 
and consequences from experiences that happened to them when they were like five years old. So these things are lasting lifetime. So if someone was, um, maybe somebody called their hair the other N word, right? Nappy at school and the teacher treated them a certain way. 70 years later, they're still saying, I'm really hurt by that. Um, or, or since then, I never felt comfortable wearing that style. Or, um, you know, I, I only wear, will wear wigs because I, I don't like my hair because of the way somebody commented on it or because I didn't get that job. I can now never wear my natural hair to a, a, a interview. So it shifts our um, pride um, in a certain ways and um, really challenges us to feel whole or complete um, or just, you know, when we don't feel like we're getting justice, that that can have um, long term um, impacts such as like uh, we use the language of weathering, that it can actually cause high blood pressure. It can cause other metabolic diseases when we have unprocessed emotions in our body. I hope that answers the question, Natasha. Well, it, it answered it for me. <laughs> and I think that's huge. Because I think about the movie Napoli Ever After. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to respond to that? That is, would you think that's similar to what she went through with her mother having um an issue of wanting her to look more like the um Caucasians and um giving her this um trauma. I mean, you know, just giving her this this conscience and insecurity about her hair, her, her own natural hair. What do you think about that? Yeah, it, it, it's interesting because I actually have a, a research article that goes along with that topic um, called uh, White Folks Ain't Got Hair Like Us, um, Mother Daughter Stories and Hair. Okay. And so in this, in this um, publication that I have, it outlines how people um, can re reveal and sort of access these early memories where their mothers told them something about hair. And so that kind of changed the way that they saw themselves, right? Our mothers are our first stylists, right? Our mothers really are our first stylists and recognizing that that hair combing process can really racially socialize us around how we feel about being black. And so of course there is this media perpetuated ideal of long straight hair being beautiful. But we really need to disrupt that in terms of recognizing that all hair is beautiful. Um, but ha needing to have these intergenerational conversations. I even have a publication on black grandmothers and hair. How some are very affirming and saying you're beautiful during that hair combing process, while others are, you know, hitting you with the brush or the comb and saying and calling names. And so recognizing that that um, time of hair combing when we're young can really shape our relationship with our hair in the future. Yes. Now this is something that's not on the questionnaire list, but what do you think about that child that the child who thinks, who's been told she's the nappy head and all of her other siblings have hair that is the curly, what they would call the good hair, but you were the only one who broke a comb or whatever. And it was because of lack of moisture and, and good products in your hair, but you feel like that you are so different from your siblings. I did have a client and she still, she's out of town and she loves my products and she's gotten through it. But prior before her father uh, and I was on a Zoom call and I helped regrow his hair at the top. And he said, I'm going to introduce this to my ex-wife and my daughter. Mm -hmm. And he said, but when she comes in to get her hair done, do not call her a nappy head. And I was thinking, why would I? You know, <laughs> but he said, and then she told me that she suffered from depression mm -hmm. uh, because everyone around her had that beautiful wavy hair or Indian hair. And she had uh, what she called the nappy hair. How would you respond to someone out here listening that, I always felt like they was like the black sheep of the family when it came to, uh, we know weight could be a problem and your the texture and the color of your skin, but also your hair could be a problem if it's that hair that don't quite grow or a little, little tough on the comb or, you know, in the roots. What would you say? 
Mm. Yeah, unfortunately, this comes up a lot. There's a lot of texturism, right, in terms of people, even within families, are being discriminated against or made to feel less than. Um, it's interesting because I think that it definitely has roots on the plantation. Um, and thinking about the Black people who had longer, straighter hair were often tasked with domestic tasks in the home versus those who had more tightly coiled or short hair were dele delegated to tasks on the field and manual labor. That um, there has been a, a caste system that gets applied to hair in terms of literally access to privilege or money or jobs. There's, you know, research suggesting that people who have um, looser curl patterns tend to make more money. Like just thinking about how society set up or even being put into positions of leadership, even thinking about our vice president, Kamala Harris, right? Her hair texture compared to maybe some other um, black women who have more tightly coiled um, curl patterns and factoring into how um, well people are treated on hair. Yeah, I, I think that that we really have internalized these white ideals of beauty, that we have suffered from systems of white supremacy that have really made us question our own um, black aesthetics. Uh, this didn't exist before racism, right? This th that that consciousness um, wasn't based <laughs> in an African worldview, and so I I really think that. Um, what that particular client you described was going through is you know, suffering from, again, the, the system of white supremacy and racism that a lot of us have really internalized and internalized at a community level and especially a family level. Um, I think in the past, people have been more open to talking about how color and colorism um, impacts relationships, but hair to me is just as important factor. I read an article in um, a psychology journal saying that um, weight to white women is hair to black women. In mm. terms of, yeah, so weight to white women is hair to black women. In terms of white women struggle significantly, right? In terms of um, fat phobias and just eating disorders and things like that, um, where their value is connected to their weight. But um, considering we live in a, a race-based society and hair being the most easily manipulated part of our racial appearance, that we oftentimes are put into a position to um, regulate our hair um, the way white women regulate their weight. And so I, I'm very much mindful that, um, you know, we can't change our skin color on a day-to-day -day basis. We can't change our lips or our nose, but people feel like they can change their hair. And so this is where um, hair then becomes a signal or marker of how black you are. Um, even in thinking about historically when, when there would be reward potion, po po uh, reward posters for um, enslaved Africans that escaped from the plantations, that they would describe the skin color, but they also would describe their hair texture. What a lot of enslaved Africans ended up doing when they would run away is that they would shave their hair off or cover up their hair to not let others know that they were actually black. Um, because the hair kind of lets, <laughs> lets you know how, how much African ancestry you have. And so um, unfortunately it's seen as a marker of shame versus pride. I like to say when people break combs that, ooh, you got strong hair. Think about how that's a different, yeah. comb, right? Your hair is so strong that you could break things with it. That's how I look at it. <laughs> yeah, that's strength, yes. yes. So I, I like to substitute strong for, you know, have tightly coiled, you know, like that, that your hair is resistant to um, the things that try to change it. So I, 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 I approach things like that sometimes. I love it. Um, let's switch the channels a little bit. Um, bless you. Thank you. Uh, this, this sounded like a good one. Yes. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> So um, switching the channels a little bit, because um, I want your opinion on something. Um, do you feel that the millions of people that's in the African-American community that is suffering uh, from hair loss, and I don't know if it's suffering for them, but where they are 
uh, receiving hair loss, do you feel like it's from braids, weaves, protective styles, self-neglect, um, why they are losing their hair? And in your opinion, do they even care? Hmm. Okay. I'll go with data. You know, I, I like to stick to data sometimes. Um, in answering, um, Dr. Yolanda Lenzi, who is a dermatologist as well as a cosmetologist, did a study in 2019, and it revealed that about 47% of Black women will experience hair loss at some point in their life, 47%. And so when she looks into that, the, the causes for that, it definitely can relate to um, traction alopecia, which is that excessive pulling around along the hairline due to braids or even locks. People don't realize getting um, locks and palm rolling or even um, can really pull the hair out from you know the root um, from excessive twisting. Um, so I. And I think that when you know, if if wigs or lace fronts are not applied properly, that it can really you know pull hair out, um, depending on glues or weaves if they're in too long. All these different factors, right? Um, in terms of the actual hair styling technique, can definitely cause hair loss. Other factors are um, just related to health and illnesses. Period. Right? In terms of chemotherapy related to um, even, I know my grandmother uh, lost her hair from, not laughing, but from taking a medication when she had a hip replacement surgery. So um, she, she had her hips replaced and took whatever was prescribed to her and her hair fell out and never grew back again. Um, just like this, the, on her crown particularly. So she had hair on the sides, but she wore a wig the rest of her life. And she had way more hair than like down, down her waist. She had tons of hair. So it was a real shift in her identity, but she had a health issue that um, then had side effects, right? Uh, medical side effects. Um, but I also think just if hormonal concerns in terms of balancing our endocrine system, like I was saying earlier, just even hair loss due to um, shift in estrogen levels, hair loss due to postpartum shedding, Right. In terms of I can always tell when a client of mine has just had a baby, like just looking at their hair, just in terms of the, the um, hair loss patterns. So I, I'm mindful that there are nutrient <laughs> related issues in terms of the body not having um, no protein or other nutrients to sustain healthy hair growth. Right. Because other organs of, of the body system will take the nutrients first and hair sort of gets it last. Um, so that's why we can tell um, hair loss that, that something is sometimes missing in someone's diet. And that's why supplements and things like that are very important and helpful um, for healthy hair growth uh, as a way to regulate the body system. But I feel like there are just so many causes of hair loss um, that it would be hard to say how people feel about it um, in terms of people who can regrow their hair versus people who, you know, it will never come back. Um, but I think oftentimes for women in particular, we can lose a sense of our femininity when we experience hair loss because um, you know we're taught that being a woman or being beautiful is associated with our hair and especially the length and density of our hair. And so it really challenges us to um, still feel feminine and beautiful without having any. And so I think that that's um, something as a psychologist that I help some of my clients negotiate um, that sense of identity and beauty despite not fitting like this ideal um, of beauty that society puts out. Okay. Um, I also, that, it, it makes a lot of sense um, because there are so many different ways you can um stumble or um, into hair loss. Um, I really feel that sometimes when I see uh, someone who I know that could get some type of help and when I see someone shave the top of their head off to put a lace front on or 
a man weave on. It's like, that's that band-aid that I'm like, wow, um, you are, um, what do you feel like uh, the salon professionals, not all of them, but are some of them more into showing off their craft than making sure the crown is safe? Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna put you on the witness stand and <laughs> yes. uh, <laughs> yeah, this is hard, right? Because I think people go to hair care professionals to get a certain look. And sometimes stylists and barbers want to help their client achieve the look that they're asking for, regardless of the health of that technique. And so there are, are lots of people that I've spoken to who've ha ha had hair loss caused by a stylist or barber. <laughs> but also um, recognizing that, that some cosmetologists and barbers are not skillful when it comes to um, keeping the hair healthy. They know how to style the hair, but don't necessarily keep the hair healthy. And so I definitely think that there are Band-Aids, right? That if we're, we're shaving the head and putting on um, a lace front man weave that it's not addressing the levels of testosterone and his body, right, that are causing probably some of that hair loss. Um, I think that it's important, again, that we consult physicians um, and, and get blood tests and get scalp samples. Um, I know that people have a lot of shame, though, around hair loss. They just want it covered, it, covered up, put, put a wig on it, put a weave on it, put some braids in it, glue something in, right, to cover it up versus um, actually healing what what's going on in the I have some biologists right in the microbiome right in terms of what the actual um biology of the scalp is what bacteria are on there what what scalp diseases could be a factor um and how sometimes the products that are used or the hairstyling techniques make things worse so that that's my testimony for the stand okay <laughs> I would like to know your opinion on the um, the years and years. I've been in the business 36 years behind the chair. And I would like your take on the brainwashing mm. that has caused people to give up subconsciously because um, I've had hairstylists as well as the everyday person, the client or whoever that says, well, um, I'm not, you know, I'm not drinking my water and, you know, that's why my hair fell out. And um, also I'm getting older. My whole family's lost their hair. And and we've, we've grown, we've, we've beat all those challenges, you know, and all the things and um, with our systems. But what would you say, because the brainwashing is so huge, how would you say you would have, approach someone who is triggered and embedded that there's no hope for them because of so many of undiagnosed theories that came from the gutter and just came from your mouth and your mouth and then like guerrilla marketing everybody just started spreading it like a bad virus mm -hmm. and no one did the research you just said if you drink that your hair gonna turn blue now tell her 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 now the whole world says well you drink that your hair turn blue but there's no research there's nothing behind it there is nothing that has proven the situation that you're talking about because i've proven that it doesn't matter about your age you can still have a head full of hair so I don't, you can't step to me and say, well, because I'm 70 is over because that's not true. We, we have too many testimonials and all that. What would you say for a person who, who's given up and the world as a general who thinks that brainwashing that they've heard about, the different things that they've heard about, it's almost like you have to unbrainwash them to prove to them that there is hope for you and you'll be all right. 
All right, I'm gonna call on the ancestors for this one. Um, there is an African proverb that says, truth went to the marketplace, but could not be sold, while lies were bought with ready cash. Again, I'll say it. Mm -hmm. Truth went to the marketplace and could not be sold, but lies were bought with ready cash. And so that's an African proverb that's, that I think can apply to the, this situation in terms of um, it's, it's easier for people to buy the lies and recognize the truth um, because sometimes the lies feel better. The lies are trendy. The lies get you likes on social media. The lies get you clients. The lies get you money. Um, but recognizing that ultimately, right, the the health of the body and your investment in taking care of your hair and your body results in um, healthy hair, right? There's you, you, you can't glue your way out of um, having to actually invest in your body, um, in your mind, in your spirit, that it's a holistic approach. And so I think sometimes with the gimmicks that are on the market right now, if you just take this one pill or if you just use this one product, that it will cure you. Um, when we know that the, the body works in systems, that we, that stress, right, that um, is a factor. And just even your relationship with yourself, how you talk to yourself and how you think about um, your appearance factors in and how you care for yourself and who you let care for you. This, this is having me get real sentimental, but it's it's disappointing that um, how much misinformation is out there um, and the need for more self-study for people to actually pay attention to what happens when they use a certain product or eat a certain food to see how their body shifts or changes. Um, I think that, that, you know, since we exist within a capitalist society, that whatever is going to sell is going to be considered the truth. So um, that, <laughs> just thinking about like specifically how money rules us and um, guides what we believe versus what what we know to be true at our gut. Um, yeah, and, and I think too that, that the miseducation process has happened. Um, so I think there's three types of education. There's um, diseducation, where people don't know anything about others or don't know anything about themselves. I think miseducation happens where we're focused on other groups or other people and don't actually study our own selves or history or health or hair. And then I think education happens when we just totally study ourselves and study others to gather um, information. And so you can't buy into somebody else's uh, information if you're not studying your own self. So that, that is a key to both hair health and mental health, actually knowing who you are. I don't know if that's the way you were expecting me to answer, but that's what was coming to me. So <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of got more. I, okay. got, I, got a, I got a lot. And I put you on the spot with that. Okay. And, and I got more. It, it allowed me to not surface it and go deeper. Hmm. So I, I really like that. And it was um, so I, I love the way that you, you answered that. Uh, definitely want to talk to you at a later date with some other stuff. Um, so I like to put people on the spot, you know. So um, also, uh, you all. I'm going to repeat this one more time that she said. Truth went into the marketplace that cannot be sold and the lies were sold with cash. Is that what you said? So I I, I want you all to remember that. And I'm going to steal it. You know, so. <laughs> African proverbs are for, for all of us. African proverbs are for all yes, of us. Yes, and um, I love it. And I appreciate that with you. Also, um, what is what is some of the things that um, you want to leave these people with? Because um, it just could have been me and you with some coffee or tea, you know. Uh, but what is it 
that you want to leave them with for them to remember uh, your truth. See, I know my truth, but you have your truth. What is it that you want them to remember about you in a legacy level? Um, I'll do African proverb again, since that's on my head. <laughs> okay, okay. I like the African proverb, um, no matter how far the river travels, it will never forget its source. And no matter how far the river travels, it will never forget its source. And so I definitely look to African culture and history as a guiding point on health and hair. Um, that, right, our hair has existed for millennia and it's been taken well care of with beautiful styles, um, products, combs that, that um, have such a rich history and culture. And so really recognizing that hair was used in all sort of rituals in the African continent, whether naming ceremonies, rites of passage programs, marriages and even death ceremonies, that hair really is a way that we can prepare our mind, body and spirit to receive a blessing. And so I really see part of my life purpose is um, teaching people about how to take care of themselves from <laughs> doing, I guess a checkup from the neck up. I like to think about a checkup from the neck up in terms of really thinking about our minds and our hair and the connection for that. And so I would love the opportunity to be able to teach folks in hair history. Um, I do identify myself as a hair historian. Um, I love all things hair history. It's a unique <laughs> entry point, but um, I would love to teach people about mental health first aid, recognizing that you have a role and a choice in taking care of other people's mental health. And even to really thinking about how we can um, <sighs> really have a, a path to having strong roots and, and understanding that um, it's our responsibility to, to heal and take care of ourselves one follicle at a time. So I'm just glad to be able to have the conversation and hope folks can check, check out um, my website, cyclotherapy.org to find out about classes and information and opportunities to um, use hair as an entry point for mental health. So you've given them a deal. So what do they expect all in the classes? Uh, psychotherapy.org, you guys, copy that down. Um, and um, the classes are just 500. So they should be what, $1,200. And that's November the 10th and the 11th. Um, but this is like a deal of a lifetime to just have the classes at uh, $500. If I needed to know more and dive in about my crown, uh, what do they expect for the deal? This is a entry level deal. So what do they expect to get? Okay. So for that $500, you will receive 12 hours of direct instruction from me, a psychologist and a stylist, as well as um, a team of folks that work with me. And so you will learn the history of our hair. You will learn how to diagnose various signs of mental illness in communities of color. You'll learn psychotherapy techniques in terms of how to assess someone for harm of self or other, how to engage in active listening, how to impart information about culture, and how to refer to resources respectfully. How do you get your clients or people in your community connect to a therapist that is culturally competent? Um, and you'll have the opportunity to do role plays. You'll have the opportunity to create things. Um, there is a test but to really make sure that you are studying um, and really comprehending how critical your role could be in helping and supporting someone else's mental health. All right, you guys, you got it. I mean, just $500, but today, uh, Deserve Professional Hair Care Products will sponsor you for $250, okay? And we, yes, so we will pay 50% of your $500. That should be $1,200, but we're going to pay... Uh, $250 of that. And we're going to, I'm going to give them my marketing team and we're going to still market that out to get people uh, that didn't, didn't see it or we're going to do a replay of it and where they can actually um, win this. Um, but someone can win the opportunity today. Um, and I have several things <laughs> uh, that's down here. If you can quote what um, the African 
Proverbs was when I asked her the question um, and we talked about um, the brainwashing and everything. And she spoke, I'll give you little nuggets about the marketplace. Um, give me that whole Proverbs, that African Proverbs about what she said about not, not the last one. Uh, no, no matter uh, how the river travels, it will never forget its source. But the one before that, when we were talking about, that's the one that you're going to get. So about the marketplace and about when we're talking about brainwashing and lies, if you can give me that whole thing, I will write the check for $250. Woo! And I got you. Okay. So I will write that check. And if you can type it in now in the chat and give me what I asked for, and um, we're going to go ahead and do that. But for, we're going to do this for a whole, oh Lord, somebody. <laughs> okay. Uh, Janine Hunter said, truth went to the marketplace and could not sell uh, the lie and went to the market and was bought with cash. Is that what you said? That was, I, I think we could go with it. Truth went to the marketplace and should not be sold, but lies were bought with ready cash. Is wow. that it? Yeah, we, we could go with that. We could go with that. Can we say we have a winner? Yeah. Yeah, we can okay. say that. We can say that. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, Janine is my girl now. <laughs> yeah, so she's actually a hairstylist in Nashville, Tennessee. Oh, and yes. she specializes in healthy hair as well as she does protective styles. She makes custom wigs and she does weaves. And she's definitely uh, into, you know, hair care. So with that being said, Janine is the winner. Yay. I am going to match $250. So uh, she needs to go to psychohairtherapy.org. Uh, the classes are just $500. But what I'm gonna do is um I got her cash app. I can cash up <laughs> her. <laughs> uh she has the Janine is a Christian, so we're good. Yeah. So, but we're gonna get her the money. Uh, but we're gonna we have to, but but I think my market people, but we have to write the check and give her the check. Okay. So I have to mail the check out to her <laughs> with it on there. So but um Let's say, Janine, Janine said, hallelujah. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, blessings to you both. And Natasha says, uh, congrats. So, hey, so we have a winner. And I think that was the best gift yeah. of the giveaway. And um, is there a uh, discount code? Right now, It I don't think it is because she's giving everybody the 500. It will go up, right? Yes, yeah. yeah. so, today's prices won't be tomorrow's price. <laughs> yeah, uh, Janine um, is the only one that will get deserve to pay 50%. And then we will also uh, put on our social media and make sure people get to your class. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, so um, this is our time is, is up, you guys. Uh, also, we want to... Um, express to you, uh, Dr. Afia, that we are behind you in everything that you're doing. And this is not the last of the last uh, that we would, as you do things, please let us know so we can support. We would like to uh, support you. Uh, we want everybody to put in the chat and to thank her for coming out. This is a woman been to Congress. Uh, she's been on Good Morning America. Put it in the chat and thank her with from the bottom of your heart for being able to give us uh, this time. So we want you to let's give her a hand clap. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 So we, we thank you guys. But also real quick, 
make sure you check your emails and go over to Deserve Divas because Deserve is actually giving away over $100 worth of free products. So we want you all to continue the healthy hair journey. Go over there. You have to submit a 30 to 60 second video and submit it on Deserve Divas. And you have to show the products and give us your testimonial about it. And you will get to Deserve Wine Glass, T-shirt, as well as other products to help you to start your healthy hair journey because you simply what deserve it so we want to thank our special guests and and thank you for honoring uh this platform so um janine said thank you for sharing um natasha said awesome information and thank you as well so we have people who who love you so anything you want to say uh, last thing before we end yeah, this this was lovely. Thank you for sharing this space to me. I love talking here to you. Um, and if people want to follow me on social media, like Instagram, you can follow me at Dr. Fia. So D-R underscore A-F-I-Y-A or at Psychotherapy um, to follow the, the Psychotherapy Instagram. I'm so, so glad to chat with you today. Okay. Um, and also Janine Hunter says, Angela Hughes, bless your ministry. <laughs> so, so thank you for that. Yes, um, a lot of people sometimes say you love to talk about everybody else, and I said, I said, I just this is ministry and purpose for me. I feel like I I pray before this got started. Mm -hmm. I I saw you as my sister, my African American sister before I met you, uh, and I knew. And I a special thank you to Natasha Wright. Uh, she's on the marketing team, and she's finding great people to be influenced with our audience. I thank you for that. So you guys remember, as we close, I always say, everyone deserves a second chance at healthy hair. Happy Sunday. And remember to keep God first. And I hope you paid your tithes. All right. Good night. Talk.